grab a Bible, join us in James chapter 5. We're continuing a verse-by-verse study. We long that you would be there with us. So once more, Bible, hopefully, you brought. If you didn't, they're around you in chairs nearby, available for this purpose. We really want you to hear it. We want you to hear God's Word. We want Him to speak to you. We want Him to speak in this moment. We want it to make impact into your life. We're hoping that through every possibility of seeing, hearing, and just being here, that God would meet you. So let's ask Him for that. Let's take this moment and just ask for God's power, ask for His touch, and just present ourselves to Him as those who want to hear His voice. Would you join me? Father, we thank You so much that You are a God who is so present. God, You are so good. In Your goodness, in Your presence, would You help us to hear Your voice right now? You have given us Your Word the Bible that we have before us. You said you gave it with aim and intention and purpose to speak into our lives, and this morning we just need that. Would you help us individually even now to hear from you? Just give us ears to hear what your Spirit would say this day. May it be done. May you transform and be in that process of transformation in our lives this morning. I'm asking, depending, looking to you to do that. We pray for that together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, it's an interesting thing to wonder. I mean, I wonder what it would look like if people really had the the Pinocchio thing take place in their lives. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Like what a world would look like if you know the story, right, of this wooden boy that wants to become authentic, that wants to become real. And yet part of his struggle is that every time he tells a lie, his nose grows. And I wonder at times, I wonder what that would like look like, you know, if like everybody who's lying, I mean, what a, what a, what a weird world that would be. But for you, if you know Jesus here this morning, it actually shouldn't affect It shouldn't work that way in your life because God has a different plan for us. In fact, that's exactly what he wants to speak to us here. Would you grab your Bible? There, James chapter 5. Notice with me verse 12, which is the verse we're going to look at this morning. God says it this way. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. It's a pretty clear verse in many ways, a thought that he's coming, telling us right now that our yes is meant to be our yes, our no, a no. That's the standard that God is speaking, and it's something he wants to bring into your life and mine. Now, we want to understand what that means. And again, wanting to be in that place of God speaking to us. So would you notice how it began there in verse 12? He begins this way by saying, but above all, my brethren, speaking to Christians, this is a truth for Christians, but he says above all. What does he mean by that? Well, for starters, understand this, it really does separate this truth and make it kind of a standalone truth or just changing subject, which he has done often in his letter. In other words, to say it this way, to use the word my brethren, And also to use this lets us know that we're not continuing where we were. We were talking about patience last week and the week before and looking at what that looked like. And this isn't an extension of that. In fact, it's not really connected to the the verses behind it either. It's just a truth. Now, again, that's not a problem. James has been doing that, but it helps us. It helps us to go, okay, so this is here. James is saying it here. It's not connected in that sense, or it's not, you know, saying continuing in the previous thought. It's it's stating a new one for us. But he does so with emphasis. He does so by saying, above all. Now, when James says this, don't misunderstand what he's saying. He is not saying that this is the greatest and most important truth in the Bible. That's not the way above all is, is rendered in the Greek language. It's not what it's saying. It's not saying, hey, this is more important than the cross, or this is more important than the love of God, or not even just more important than everything else that James has said in his letter. Like we're to be hearers of the word and not doers only, or all the other things he said. What it does do 
is it has an idea of an expression in kind of a vernacular that would say, hey, make sure you're paying attention to this. Make sure that you understand this is important. In fact, this is vital. Because maybe, you know, as he's stating this, God fully knows that we would have a propensity, both because it's just a single verse, but also because of what it's addressing, that we might have a propensity to downplay this. Well, that's just, you know, that's just that. It's not really, I mean, we're not talking about something really important. So he's, he's, he's stopping saying, hey, don't miss this. Hey, this is important. This is vital. In fact, it's an interesting thing because not only is it James' words, but it's very, very possible that what James is doing right now is he's quoting Jesus. Yet yeah, Jesus says this very thing. There in Matthew 5, it says it this way. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. And that's, that's Jesus' words. Hey, fun fact, if you're reading with us through the Bible, you read that today. You know, it's kind of one of those interesting things, and I can be a little slow on these things. I knew I was going to be talking about this, and I already had it all picked out, but for some reason, it just hadn't even dawned on me until I sat down to read my, my quiet time this morning. It's like, oh, we're actually reading that. We're actually, we're actually in Matthew chapter 5 today. It's like, okay, this is God. God has ordered something so that we would see, hey, this is Him. And so when James is saying this to us, he's making sure he's telling us something. And again, it's not just his thought. It is certainly a quote from Jesus. And it's something he's telling us is vital. Why is it vital? Well, you know what? Hold that thought. We want to come back to it and, and maybe address that more in a second. So we'll just kind of put that to the side and say, okay, so above all, that, that's trying to catch our, our attention. It's saying it's huge. It's something significant. Then what does he say? Well, go back and see it. Verse 12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. James tells us, do not swear. That's what God's speaking about. And as he's saying this, I think you know, but it's worth just making sure I say it. We're not here talking about, you know, uh, just using bad language or, or cussing. That's not what he's addressing. Now, let me make sure I don't misstate that. That doesn't mean that's unimportant. God's word is really clear that that's not something that's of him. It's not something that's meant to be a part of our lives as followers of Christ. I think about it in Ephesians. It gives it to us this way tells us, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. He says that is not supposed to be coming out of your mouth. Don't let those words come out of your mouth. Don't let anything that is, you know, just, just would be that sense of a, of a cuss word fly out of your mouth. And in that point, the very next verse says it this way, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I mean, that's just, that just puts it way big. I mean, to say, hey, if you're a Christian, you were sealed. The Holy Spirit is living inside of you, resident. So when you cuss, he's there, and it grieves him. It grieves him because he's like, that, that's, that's not representative of, of God. That's not representative of who you're supposed to be. I mean, just a big reason not to do it and, and to not be a part of that. And so, again, that's clear biblically, but that's not this. This swearing, oh, as it goes on to say, it's an oath. It has the idea about that kind of vocabulary or speech where you back up something with a promise that it would be true cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye kind of a thing. You know, it's like, I, I promise, pinky promise, you know, I'm going to, I'll make sure I do that. Hey, I, I, I promise on, on, the, on the, you know, grave of my mom kind of a thing or some other weird thing whereby you make an oath and you back that up by validating it by something that would say, hey, this is really true. Hebrews, when it describes it, would say it to us this way. It says, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is, to, is for them an end of dispute. It says when you're kind of just looking for something that's really true, an oath is meant to be something that locks it down. 
An oath is meant to be something that makes it solid. That's what it's supposed to be, and so that's what he's addressing, and so now we have to ask the question. Is God telling us that we should never actually do that? Is he telling us right now that it's a non-Christian thing, it's a thing that we're not supposed to do, to ever be there? Does he telling you, if you're going to go into a court case and they are asking you, you know, to commit to telling the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, does that mean that that now is something you're not supposed to do? I want to be careful with this, but I want to tell you, actually, there have been believers who felt that way. Uh, It really was true within the Quaker movement, the Anabaptists, and others that looked upon this and said, you know, they really believed that for a Christian to ever take an oath, it was a violation uh, of what Jesus had to say. I want to tell you with respect and honor, I I, I just, I recognize just that believers can go different with this, and I, I honor them for that, but I want to say with a, not an accusatory, but just an honest thing, I don't think that's what this is saying. I don't think this is telling us it's wrong to, to, to make an oath. I don't think it's wrong if you have to go to court this week to, to commit to telling the truth. Why do I say that? Well, for a number of reasons. First of all, understand this. The Bible actually talks about that. The Old Testament governs the place of oaths. So, for example, in Deuteronomy, and these are just a couple of examples, God says it this way, you shall fear the Lord your God, and you shall serve him. And to, to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. It says you're going you're to hold fast to him and, and your oaths, they're, they're in his name. In fact, it would give it to us this way in the book of Numbers. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Because as you make an oath, you keep that oath. Now, key in this Old Testament description is he says this is an, a, vo- a vow or an oath to the Lord. Hold that in your mind. Don't lose that because we need to talk about that more in a moment because it goes a little bit wrong uh, in history, but it wasn't intended that way in, in passages. So the Old Testament governs it. On top of that, we have godly men and women all through the Bible who make oaths. We just read, for those who are in, in Genesis, when Abraham does it. He gets his servant and, and, and calls him to make an oath. He says, I'm going to make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife from my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. I mean, he makes his servant make an oath to him. So Abraham, he, he's, he, he does his oaths. We fast forward, though we could talk about more through the Bible, but all the way to the New Testament, we get Paul the Apostle. It says in 2 Corinthians, Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul, that to spare you no more, uh, spare you, I came no more to Corinth. He says, I'm just, God is my witness. I mean, that's an oath that's saying, you know, that this is, I mean, just, I'm making this. So Paul is doing it. Abraham did it. That's not a lone kind of key because the Bible will also let folly be known. But God himself makes oaths to us. It's there in Hebrews where we just read this verse a moment ago where it said in Hebrews 6 that men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for a confirmation is to them an end of all dispute. It says, thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. And he goes on and talks about how God made that to Abraham and, and does that. He says, God, God himself to confirm it to us, he made an oath. It's impossible for God to do the wrong thing. It's impossible for God to sin. If making oaths themselves are the issue, then God's guilty. Can't be. That's not what it's talking about. In fact, even Jesus finds himself put under an oath. There as he's facing the trial before Caiaphas. It says, and Jesus kept silent. They were asking him and accusing him. It says, then the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, it is as you say. Jesus finds himself under an oath, and he didn't say, no, no, sorry, I don't do oaths. (laughs) Oaths, not good. Oaths, I mean, I'm, I'm sinless, can't do that. No, that's not what he does, because that's not the problem. 
And that's not what's being addressed here. So just making an oath, just that you find yourself doing that, that doesn't become itself what's being t- just told us not to do. So what does it mean? What does it mean here when James says it? What does it mean when Jesus says it? In one clear way, it has the idea that you should not ever need to take an oath. The problem is not taking an oath. The problem is needing to take an oath. The problem is duplicity, being deceptive and and lying. See, I think about how Jesus said it. Let me just take you back to his passage there in Matthew 5, if you're reading this morning. Jesus told him, he said, again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform your oaths to the Lord. He says, that's what the Old Testament said. You're you're going to perform your oaths to the Lord. But then Jesus goes on to say this. He says, but I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the, of the great king. And you might be thinking, okay, so I think, I, what, what exactly is Jesus expressing? Well, if it wasn't clear here, he makes it clear, more clear, helps us understand what was happening And you could get this just from the Bible, but you could fast forward to Matthew 23 when Jesus is rebuking the religious leaders, and he says it this way. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, that's nothing, it's nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he's obliged to perform it. So stop and see if you can figure out what happened. God said, hey, if you're going to make an oath to the Lord, make sure you perform it. What did he mean by that? Keep your word. What did the Jews do with that? Well, they came up with ways to decide what, when you actually had to keep your word and when you didn't. And they were like, well, if you, if you swear by the temple, oh, you, could, you, you don't have to hold that. You could, you could let that go. I mean, you could lie then. But if you swear by the gold of the temple, oh, no, no, that, that, that's, that's the serious one. That's the more close promise. And so they took this Old Testament thing, and instead of just taking it, they began to look for loopholes. Like, well, there's, there's ways you can lie. I mean, you don't, you don't have to always, you know. I mean, if you, as long as you're vowing to the Lord. And so Jesus just tells them, fools and blind, which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. I mean, which, it's the temple. And then he goes on to say it again. And they said, well, whoever swears by the altar, well, that's nothing. You could, you could break that one. But whoever swears by the gift that is on the altar, he's obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? And, and again, he's just looking at these people who, who've parsed it in a way that they can get away with, okay, you have to keep your word if you say it this way, but you don't have to keep your word if you say it this way. And so Jesus just goes on to say, if you swear by any of it, it's God's. I mean, I mean it's all relating to him. I mean, you can't in any way say that this is less than that. And that's what he's dealing with. He's dealing with this place where people have come up with oaths that allow them to lie unless they say it a certain way. And therein lies the problem. You guys get it, right? I mean, there's probably none of us that haven't had this somewhere in your life where, you know, maybe you and a friend really did come up with a pinky promise. It's like, okay, if we pinky promise... We are never, that, that's, that's when we tell each other the truth, you know. None of that. You know, you were there maybe in, in grade school where somebody told you something and then they didn't do it. And you're like, what happened? It's like, I had my fingers crossed behind my back. You know, it's like, like somehow that made it okay. And you're like, so then later you're like, okay, don't put your, I want to see your hands before you make the promise. And then later they say, well, I had my toes crossed. And you're like, what? How, do you, how did you get away with that? I mean, what is this whole weird thing? That's the problem. Emmett Thickle said it this way. Whenever I utter the formula, I swear by God, I am really saying, now, I'm going to mark off an area of absolute truth and put walls around it and cut it off from the muddy floods of untruthfulness and irresponsibility that ordinarily overruns my speech. I mean, can you just like, so if, I, if I'm going to come up with it this way, I'm going to say, okay, here's the one I tell the truth. I mean, don't ever trust me outside of this because this is the only time you'll ever get the truth from me. He goes on to say, in fact, I'm saying even more than this. I'm saying that people are expecting me to lie from the start. 
And just because they are counting on my lying, I have to bring these big guns of oaths and words of honor because they know they can't take me at my word. That's the problem. That reality Jesus was stepping into, and again, it's still in our culture. We have, we have so many that, again, get away with things because they just don't take it as serious in, in the midst of it. So there, Jesus is talking about this. James is talking about this. They're saying that's not what you're supposed to do. That's the negative. What's the positive? Well, you know, but read it. Verse 12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or any other oath, but the positive Let your yes be yes, and your no, no. He says, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to let your yes be yes, and your no, no. That is so powerful. It's said so simplistically, but I want to tell you how, how wonderful it is. There's a place where what it should be saying is that oaths are entirely unnecessary for you. If you find yourself needing to make an oath, it actually doesn't change anything. You know, that's how it is for God. Go back to that passage we were just talking about in Hebrews 6. God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. So God gave them an oath. God gave them an oath so that they would really just could, could know how serious this is. But he says this, that, By in two immutable things, in which it's impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who fled to the refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. When God made an oath, it didn't change what he said. It made no difference, because God doesn't lie. If God just said it, he meant it. But for our sake, he, he gives an oath, not because it changes the quality of what he was saying, but he just does it for our comfort. He does it so that we could get strength out of it, but it didn't change what he was going to say. If you find yourself needing to make an oath, you find yourself again in a court case and they're asking you to swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, it shouldn't change what you were going to say at all. Oh, I guess... Now I'm going to have to tell the truth. I wasn't going to before, you know. It's like, no, I mean, I can do that. But you know what? It doesn't change. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be no more truthful now than I would have been because that's not what I do. I mean, my yes is meant to be my yes and my no, my no. God is calling you and I to be people of integrity, that we be those who, whose words are valued, whose, you know, what we say is trusted, that it be a part of that. And, and this is really big because we live in a world that is absolutely dominated by lies. We live in a world that thrives on it. Jesus said that Satan is the father of lies, and he is. And, and into our culture, it so works so that, honestly, we're not even that shocked when people lie any longer. We're not shocked when, you know, media kind of twists things into their perspective and and people from both sides, right and left, take things and and twist it by their perspective. It doesn't even, I mean, we're just almost unmoved by it. John MacArthur said it this way. He said, fallen men are basically habitual liars. I mean, it's just what we are by sin. Our society is built on such a framework of lies, leading one to wonder whether our social structure would survive if everyone were forced to speak the truth for even one day. I think think that's funny, but I think it's absolutely true. It's like, yeah, it would probably crush our world because lies, I mean, they, they make up our world. They make up how it happens. They make up how that works. But what God is telling us in a world that is just consumed by lies, that thrives on lies, he says, you and I are to be a people of truth, that what he's wanting for you what he's desiring for you is that. That our yes would be our yes, our no, no. With that held before us, let's go back to where I left you a moment ago in an addendum where, where he began by telling us, hey, this is above all. And we understood that, again, God is making sure we didn't downplay the significance of this. He's letting us know this is really, really important. So let's, again, ask the question just practically. Why? 
Why is it so important in your life and in my life that God would just form this in us? What, what makes this such a central, such an important, such a big truth? Well, it's because God is pursuing something in you. What we have described here in the book of James is real faith and a fake world. Right? You guys know this if you've been with us in James. In fact, every uh, time we begin it, we begin with this little logo that has it at the beginning of our study where we've called this study in James authentic. That God is looking for something that is real. He's seeking to build reality in a world that is so fake, in a world that thrives on, on fakeness. He's saying, here's what he wants for us, is that we would be real. That what God is looking in you is to build reality, not hypocrisy. That, in many ways, is the opposite. Hypocrisy, that pretending to be something. The idea of putting on a mask and pretending and being what people want you to be. It is perhaps the greatest deception that is practiced every day in our world, in our city, where people will be what you want them to be. They'll, they'll, they'll pretend to be whatever that is, and, and many times because they want your approval, they want what, you, what you're saying. And God is looking at that, and that is not what he's looking for. He is not looking for your Christianity to be plastic, a mask that you put on, that you pretend to be something that you pretend to be this. God is looking for something that would change you on the inside out and when it would really be as authentic. You would be real. To get at that authenticity, then our words become so key. Again, that's what we've been talking about in James. James fundamentally has been a book that says, "Let's let's be real, let's be authentic. So it's no surprise, or it shouldn't be, that this is not the first time we've talked about our speech. In fact, every single chapter in the book of James has talked about our words and the importance of them. Let's just go back and just see a few of those places. Take your Bibles. You're there in chapter 5. Just go back to chapter 1. Most of you are just going to be turning the page. There in James chapter 1, you notice in verse 26, James said this, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. If it's not affecting how you talk, it's not even real. It's not even real, because that's not God. Fast forward to chapter 2, verse 12. He says it this way. He says, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. He says, you want to speak. You're going to speak as one who is governed by God's law of liberty, his freedom that would change the way you would speak. Go to chapter 3. There in verse 2, it says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. Yeah, wow. Some of you remember those. I mean, in fact, he goes on to talk about it more. But he says, you know, we all struggle. And this is one of the things we struggle with. We all struggle with our tongues. It's an unrulable evil, and and, and yet we we are meant to fight it. In chapter 4, Go there in verse 11. He says, Do not speak evil of of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. I don't want you to do that. Don't, Don't let your tongue be speaking evil of others. In fact, go on down to verse 13. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. It says, if this is what's flowing out of your mouth, if, if this is what's expressing, it's expressing something in your life that is not surrendered to God, James is going to go on to say. Well, again, all those would help us understand that this goal, this pursuit of authenticity, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect what we say. It should affect how we talk. It should affect what, what, what that works. And so again, without any, you know, just moving from that, he comes back to it as we're almost nearing the end of the book of James. And he just tells us again, hey, for fundamentally, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. That's what God's wanting for you. That's what God's having for your life. He's calling you and I into that. And then he gives us another reason. Go back and see it. Verse 12, chapter 5. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, 
but let your yes be yes and your no, no. Lest you fall into judgment. Lest you fall into judgment. That's the warning. That's the thing. So you, don't want, you don't want to go there. This is what you want to stay away from. What does that mean? Well, let me be again clear. He's not here threatening hell to the Christian here this morning. He's not here like, okay, if you do this, I mean, you might go to hell over that. That's not it. I mean, there's no condemnation, Romans 8 says, to those of us who are in Christ Jesus. This is not a threat. This is not held against us in some way that would cause us to, 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 to feel that or, or see that. God, God's calling us here to something that's altogether different than that. What he is telling us is that we are accountable for our words. What he is telling us is that God takes seriously your words and mine. Think about it this way. Matthew says it this. says, but a good man, uh, Jesus is speaking, by the way, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. He says, here's what happens. It says our mouth, it only reveals what's happening inside of our heart. And so for the good person, what, what, what's there is coming out. For the bad person, that's coming out. And he goes on to say this, but I say to you that for every idle word that men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. I don't know if any of us grab how serious this is. I know people, you know people, and they kind of have this aloof, you know, oh, you know, if God is, you know, if there is a God, well, he's not going to send me to hell. I mean, I'm a good person. I mean, I've never actually killed anybody that's got a raid in there. I mean, surely I'm not that much in trouble. You have no idea how much trouble you were in. You have no idea because every word you say, God accounts for. There's never a word that you say that he doesn't see and is going to hold you accountable for on that day. The judgment of the unbeliever is more fierce than any have ever imagined. But for us as believers, that still moves us because we know that we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not of condemnation, but of recognition. And he tells us this, he says, for by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, condemned. I just just wanted you to catch it. I mean, our words are a part of this, the way we say it. And so this idea of lest we fall into judgment is certainly an understanding that our words are to be taken absolutely seriously. We could even go further and say this idea of being deceptive, duplicitous, uh, not letting our yes be yes and our no, no, anytime we do that, we're on Satan's turf. We're in Satan's territory. The ESV renders this that we would fall into condemnation. And maybe that's a good rendering, that, that it would really be that which Satan does. Jesus, when he said it, you already have read it with me a couple times this morning, but read it again. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these, that's of the evil one. Once you cross that line, once you go out of that circle of your yes being yes and your no, no, you're in Satan's territory. Always. That's never God's territory. The moment you leave that, that's, that's Satan. That's what he's doing. That's what he's being a part of. And you just don't want to do that. That's not who we're, we're meant to be. We're on Satan's turf. And that would absolutely, in many ways, just be absolutely contrary to who God is and the way it works. That there is a sense that we don't want to fall into judgment. We don't want to fall into Satan's territory. We don't want to be used of him to be a part of something that would be counterproductive poor representation of God in the gospel. This is what Paul saw. He was writing a letter in 2 Corinthians to the church there in Corinth. He said, in this confidence, I intended to come to you before. Paul had told them that he had planned on coming and seeing them along his journey, that he intended to do that. It didn't work out. He didn't end up coming to them when he said he was going to come, and for a number of reasons that he expresses throughout the letter. But he says this, he says, therefore, When I was planning this, when I was planning to come and see you guys, did I do it lightly? Was I just being, you know, flippant, you know, and I wasn't really thinking it through? Or the things that I planned, do I plan according to the flesh that I that I wasn't seeking God? And it just was this just Paul? Is that is that what you're gonna say about this? Or that with me there should be yes, yes, 
and no, no. I just, is that what this is? You know, am I the kind of person that, you know, when, when I say I'm going to do something, people say, well, you know, believe it when you see it, you know, because he, you know, he says all kinds of things. He says, is that who I am? Is that who you know me to be? And he's saying, that's not who I am. With that being presented before him, what's fascinating is, 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 is Paul is almost answering this question and asking this, is, is that who I am? Is that the person that you see me to be, he says. And then he switches gears wonderfully. And yet amazingly, from the very next verse, he says, but God is faithful. Our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Sylvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. He, he's concerned that their perspective that Paul maybe isn't trustworthy would affect the way they receive the gospel from him. He says, I just want you to know we meant what we said. We meant everything that we said when we spoke Christ to you. He says, for all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. I mean, God never lies. Everything he said, he meant. And what's fascinating about reading this is Paul rightly understands that where his plans fell through, he's, he's, he's concerned that that would fall into making them begin to doubt just the veracity and trustworthiness of God and his promises. Wow. See, that's a big deal. That's where we don't want to go. We don't want to fall into judgment, not that we're going to go to hell, but into Satan's territory where it would mess up things, where it would mess up people that would move us away from that. He's calling us to something altogether different. So let's think this through practically just for a moment. Maybe it's practical enough. Some of you are like, that's, that's close enough. We could, just, we could just stop there. But I just want to just explore it with you just for a moment. What would this look like if you were to think, okay, I'm going to do this. I want, I want this to be, I want to be in step with what God's doing. If you were to kind of look at some things and say, what am I going to do with this passage this morning? Well, I think you could begin just by saying, just let your yes be yes and your no, no. I'm just going to tell you, I love that. You just can't really say it better than that. Say what you mean. Mean what you say. Say it. I mean, when you, when you say it, it just ought to be real with you. You ought to be someone that keeps your word. That when you say it, you mean it. So here's the honest question. If I could talk to your coworkers, your friends, your family, and I asked them about you. So is he, is she a person of your word, of their word? They say it, you can trust it. I'm curious what they would say. Are you that person that your friends would say, well, you know, he's kind of a believe it when you see it kind of guy. I mean, he makes lots of statements, but you know, <laughs> he does, it just doesn't always come through. So when he says something, we don't actually count on it till it actually happens. And then we'll be like, oh, he actually meant what he said. It's pretty, that's pretty cool because it's just not often that way. Are you the kind of person that when, when, you, when you say it, people just, well, you know, I don't, I don't know. If you say you're going to be somewhere, do people like, okay, he's going to be there? Or are they like, well, you know, I don't know. You know, are, are you that person that people trust when you say you're going to do something where you're going to be there and they're like oh yeah they're going to be there in fact they'll probably be there early or are you that person that people are like well you know they said they'd be there at such and such a time you got to give them some leeway in there because they just don't really do that again i'm not trying to step on your toes or or to be con condemning i don't want to be condemning i'm really aware of, of just the possibility that my words could bring in condemnation i know that's not what god's want is it's transformation but i'm just telling you it's a scary thing personal story. Some of you know this, but we've been a church now for 23 years. It's been an amazing, fun just a season to watch God work, but I was thinking back to the early, you know, couple years that we started as a church, and as we started, you know, as a small Bible study and then a small church, honestly, our start times to our services were a little bit elastic. I mean, it's like, you know, we just, you know, just kind of like waited till people got there, because otherwise it would have been like, you know, the worship leader and me, you know, sometimes, and we were like, well, you know, you got to wait till some people get here, and it's just the way we did it, and, and God had begun convicting me. I mean, I, I actually, I think I had been reading the Sermon on the Mount, and, and I was a little bit convicted. I heard somebody else talk about it, but what pushed it over the top is we were in this casual conversation, it was like in a whole, just a meeting in a home group, and somebody said um, something about what we were doing or the time we were doing, and they said, well, you know, 
It's because you guys run on Calvary time. And I'm like, what do you mean Calvary time? Well, you know Calvary time. You guys don't really mean what you say. I mean, you say you start at 10 o'clock, but Calvary time's kind of like 10, 10 05, 10 10, you know, just like, you know, it's just kind of loosey goosey. I mean, that's Calvary time. And I remember thinking, is that what we're known for? I mean, is, 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 that, is, that, is that how we, I mean, people just kind of think that we don't mean what we say? I was hugely convicted. And it was at that moment I made a decision that affects us to this day. In case you've ever wondered, like, man, Jim, why, why do we have that little countdown clock? Why, I mean, to our best of our ability, we start to the second that we say we're going to do, to do that. Why do we do that? It was this. I wanted to be a person of my word. We say we start at 8.30. We start at 8.30. That's what we, we, we said that. We want that to be true from the beginning of everything we're saying. And I just was convicted. I thought, you know, I don't want to say that I'm going to do something and let people go, well, you know, when Jim says it. It's like, eh, you, just, you never actually know how long it's actually. I mean, we wanted to be people of our word. See, the Bible calls us to do that even when things change, even when it gets difficult. It's an interesting thing in Psalm 15. God is, you know, giving it to us this way, and he says, Lord, who could abide in your tabernacle? I mean, who can really be in your presence? And he begins to describe holiness and what that looks like. And one of the descriptions of holiness is he says, well, it's, it's this person that swears to their own hurt and does not change. They promised to do something, and then circumstances changed where it now was costly to do it, where it now was hard to do it. And you know what they did? They did it. Because they told them they were going to do it. They kept their word. They, they kept their word even though it became costly to do so. And God says, that's the kind of person I want close to me. That's the reality that expresses who I am. That's the wonder that God wants in our lives. And so God is calling us to be a people that people can say, I, I, if you say it, I expect it to happen. Now, let's be honest. If you pursue such an aim and goal, you're not going to hit it because you are imperfect. Paul didn't. I mean, he intended to go to Corinth, and things happened where he didn't. And so here's what I just want to tell you. When you fail, ask forgiveness. You're going to fail. But when you fail to keep your word, don't play light with that. Don't be like, well, you know, this didn't work out. If you fail to keep your word to your friend, parent, if you fail to keep your word to your kids, own it. Say, I, I said that. This is what we're going to do. It didn't work out, but I need to let you know I'm sorry. I, that, that, that way I should not have committed to it, or I committed to it in error, and I failed to do what I said I was going to do. And I, and I, I just want you to know I'm not comfortable with failing to keep my word. I, I'm convicted by that, and I'd like to ask your forgiveness. You're going to need to do that if you take your word seriously, because there are times you're going to commit to do something that you're going to fail to do, but you just shouldn't take it lightly. Now, if you do that, can I tell you it's going to affect not just your, uh, your need to ask forgiveness, it's going to change what you say. Because the idea is don't say what you don't intend on doing. Don't say it if you don't intend to do it. I mean, you should think it through because don't make a commitment that you don't, that you don't plan on, on doing this. Hey, again, can I just speak to parents? Don't promise your kids something that you don't intend on fulfilling. Don't, don't tell them, hey, we'll do this. We'll do that. If, if you don't intend on doing it, don't make just crazy promises and then just, well, it just didn't work out. I mean, be the kind of person that before you say it, you think it through. And, and honestly, it'll change the way you say it. I, I know for me and my kids, it got to be the place where they just got tired of it, but it'd be like, here's what we're intending to do this weekend, but I need to let you know there are some things that could get in the way. But if nothing else gets in the way, then this is what we're going to do. I mean, it's like, it's like, okay, Dad, I get it. Why didn't you just say, hey, we're going to go to the park? It's like, well, because I don't want to get there. And you'd be like, yeah, Dad said we're going to go to the park. We never do what Dad says. Dad makes promises. He doesn't keep them. I just never, I didn't want that to be a part of their upbringing. I wanted them to take me seriously, that if I said something was going to happen, that they could count on it happening. And so you begin to become this person that says, I'm not going to say it if I don't mean it. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be more careful about it because my yes is to be my yes. Just, just because I didn't make a peaking promise, just because I didn't swear on a pack of Bibles, I, I'm, as, I'm as obligated to keep my word as I would if I did those things. And I should be more careful about what I say. Because here's the thing. God just wants you to love the truth. He just wants you to love the truth, to be a, a lover of the truth. And I hope that you are. 
I hope I'm saying these things here this morning. You're not like, boy, this is just so like not where I am. Because I want to tell you, God wants you to do this. Think about it this way. Paul's writing in 2 Thessalonians, and he says, the coming of the lawless one. That's the term of the Antichrist, by the way. Satan's puppet that's going to be coming on the scene probably soon. He says, when he comes, when this lawless one comes, it's going to happen. It's going to happen according to the working of Satan. He's going to do what Satan does. The way Satan works, the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to come with power and signs and lying wonders. He's going to lie. But you can do so with power and things, and it's going to be with unrighteous deception. It's going to be deceptive. It's going to be lying. It's going to be twisting. It's going to do that because that's what Satan does, and so it's no surprise that that's what the Antichrist is going to do. But what I want to draw your attention to is he says it's going to happen. The Antichrist is going to come among those who perish because, this is fascinating, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. He says, the world's going to buy into this because they don't love the truth. They didn't receive that love of the truth because God's giving love of truth. He says, because they don't love truth, they're going to buy into the lie. And God's saying, no, if you love the truth, if you love the truth, it will be one of those things that rescues you from that. If you love the truth, it would be a place where that would, you would not fall prey to that. See, I think about what Jesus said. He was being interrogated by Pilate. Pilate was asking him if he was a king, and he said yes. And he goes on to say, for this cause I was born. And for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone, Jesus says, everyone who is of the truth, here's my voice. Those people who love the truth, those people who are of the truth, they listen to me because that's what we're doing. That's an amazing description. Maybe you know the scene, because Pilate goes on to say, well, what is truth? I mean, like, I don't even know what that is. And that's our world. But Jesus is the truth. I think about how Jesus would say it earlier, just a few hours before that in John 14, he said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, you want to know who I am? I'm the only way to God. And I am the truth. That's amazing. That's who Christ is. So it's in all of that that I just want to tell you this morning, God is calling you to be someone that says, that's, I, I, I want that. I love truth. I love that Jesus is the truth. I, lo- I love truth in this world, and I want it to permeate my life. God is inviting you. He's calling you. Again, not with a condemnation. I hope this hasn't come down as a heavy hand to beat you up for your failures. This is not my heart. But he is inviting you to say, here's what I, I am. I'm, I'm a per, I, I am the truth, Jesus is saying. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. This is what I do. And he's inviting you to be in step with that. And if you're going to be in step with that, it's going to form the way you say things. And it'd be this idea that when you think about it, that above all, you're not going to you know, have this place where this is where I lie and this is where I tell the truth. I don't, I don't do that. My yes is my yes. My no is my no. Because I don't, I don't want to play into Satan's territory. I don't want to be used by him. I don't want to feed that. And I'm just inviting you today. And here's what I know. It might feel convicting. And it does to me a little bit but it's so inviting. I know I'm talking to some of you this morning because I know this. I'm hoping in this room, there are people here, you love the truth. You love authenticity. It's like you want authenticity. You hate hypocrisy. You hate to see people pretending to be what they're not. It drives you crazy. And you're like, I want reality. I want that which is real. I want that which is genuine. I want truth. I love truth. And, he, and I love that you do. And if you love that, if you are a lover of the truth, then this morning, I'm just calling you to truth, to him who is truth. And that that would affect your words. That would change it so that when you say yes, you mean yes. When you say no, you mean no. And, and it would just be as simple as it could be. So that's where we're going to end this morning. You can take your Bibles, notebooks, close those, and let's just go before God and ask for that. 
I do want to say this, even as I was expressing it. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus. God would say, he, you know, that's what it said in Thessalonians. He said that the people who are buying into Satan's lie, it's because they didn't receive the love of the truth. I hope this morning you'd receive a love of the truth from God. Because Jesus is promising, everybody who is of the truth hears my voice. And I invite you to be that. I invite you into Christ, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And that this morning, you could be changed by the truth. Let's pray for that. God, I thank you that you are true. I love that you are immutable. I, I love that you could never lie. It is impossible for you to lie. God, you are the truth. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. I thank you for giving and imparting that love of the truth in, in a very fresh way. I just want to receive that. I want to receive that from you and ask for it. Because God, I, I want to love the truth. I want to love the truth in my life. I want to love it in such a way that authenticity is that which I am radically pursuing. So much so that I just want my words to be true. When I say it, I want to mean it. I want people to be able to count on it. If I say something, I want them to know that there's veracity in that. That I don't just say things. God, where that's untrue of us right now, where we have played into Satan's hand, where Satan is using our lack of truthfulness to even lead people astray, we just pray against that. And pray that today you would rescue us and you would draw us into a place that truth would be what we are and do. With that in mind, I pray for any here that don't know you, that you would rescue them. And you would draw them to the truth. Right here, right now, we ask for that. Would you take a moment? I've begun you in prayer, but we want to give you a moment to pray as well. I'm not certain where it's come across to you this morning, and I want to say it again as carefully as I can. I have not meant to condemn. If you feel condemned this morning, that's not God's voice and it's certainly not mine. I am inviting you to transformation. The Bible says that, that God is changing us. He is transforming us from the inside out, authentically, wonderfully. And I'm inviting you to let him do it, to make you an authentic person. Your yes, your yes, your no, your no. Quietly, would you talk to God about that wherever it is that he's met you this morning? I'll do the same. And then we'll close in prayer and worship in just a moment. God, would you indeed do that authentic work inside us? Would you transform us by the renewing of our minds that we could prove that which is good, that which is acceptable, that which is perfect, your will in our lives? I'm asking, Lord, in a very genuine way that you would so work in our lives that your word would change us would change us so that it would be true in our lives, that you would let our yes be our yes and our no be no. 
would that permeate our entire speech? We ask for that right now and even just ask for your transformation in a fresh way. We do that together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God meet you in that. May he draw you to the wonder of who he is, a God who is incredibly true. We're going to close now in worship, so why don't you stand? We want to give you an invitation and just say, hey, maybe you need prayer this morning. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you have questions. Maybe this has left you in a place that you need prayer. After this song, we're going to sing a song together, but after it, Pastor Phil will be up front. Make your way up. If we need others, we'll grab them. We would love to talk to you and pray with you and just step in in this moment with you. But right now, we want to invite you to worship with us as we just make God our focus. And with that as a name, I just want to bless you in his name. There at number six, it says it this way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. He is exalted. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. Rejoice in his holy name. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. I will praise him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign, heaven and earth, rejoice in His holy name. Exalted, the King is exalted on high. He is the Lord. He is the Lord. Forever His truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in His holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. He is exalted, the King is exalted on Well, Father, we do come before you and just rejoice in who you are, that you are a God who cannot lie. I pray, Lord, you would cause us to be lovers of the truth. Work it in each one of us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.